The March 9th work session of the Williamsburg City Council will come to order. Ms. Felica, would you call the roll, please? Mr. Maslin. Here. Ms. Ramsey. Here. Mayor Freiling. Here. Vice Mayor Pons. Here. Mr. Zhang. Here. On our agenda, we have uh, items for City Council meeting of March 11th. Council preview, Mr. Trivet, anything you'd like to highlight? Uh, we have a couple things under new business. We have uh, Resolution 2003, which certifies the streets that we'll be requesting additional payments for through VDOT maintenance program, uh, the update to the emergency operations plan, and another resolution um, supporting the combination of the two workforce boards, one from the peninsula and one from the south side. Any questions for Mr. Trivet? No, sir. No, sir. If anybody in the audience would like to address council on any of the items coming up on the agenda for our March 12th meeting, we welcome you to come forward. If you could state your name and address, keep your comments to five minutes. <coughs> Seeing no one, we will move on to background presentations and discussion. And today we will be working with our outside agency presentations. We have four of those today. Mr. Trivet, anything you'd like to? Add before we open these up? Sure, absolutely. You know, every year as part of the budget process, um, the finance department and I wade through the uh, outside agency requests that come in. The council funds a, a whole host of outside agencies in various sections of the budget. And we empower a couple of different groups to help us with the process of deciding what should be funded and how much. And we're going to hear from some of those today as well as the uh, larger recipients of outside agency funding. So we're going to start with the Social Services Advisory Board. And I'm not sure who is going Susan to Gennaro? represent Ms. Gennaro. Susan and Susan. Oh, Susan and Susan. Susan and Susan. Mm -hmm. Susan. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. And good afternoon, Mayor Fryland, members of the council. The Williamsburg Social Services Advisory Board is pleased to present to you our recommendations for the 2021 Partner Agency funding. As in previous years, the board takes several things in consideration when reviewing applications and making recommendations to council. The five questions we consider are, does the agency provide both necessary and direct services to city residents? Are the services non-duplicative and cost-effective to city residents? Are the services provided by the agency prompt, accessible, and affordable, with no one being denied due to inability to pay? This includes free services or sliding scale option for individuals. Does the agency work closely and network with the city's human services staff and other agencies so not to cause duplication or fragmentation of services? Is the amount of funding the city provides proportionate to the amount of neighboring localities, the amount neighboring localities provide relative to the percentage of citizens served by the city and other localities? Are we looking closely at the number of city residents served by each program? In the current fiscal year 2020, the city is currently funding 14 outside agencies in the health and human services area, and total funding for these agencies equals $458,150, with the majority of the funding supporting Old Town Medical Center and Colonial Behavioral Health. I will now hand it over to Susan Gennaro, the Social Services Advisory Board Chair. Thank you. Thank you. And good afternoon, Mayor Freiling and members of the Council. For fiscal year 2021, all the agencies reapplied for funding with the addition of one new application from Housing Partnerships. Also part of the partner agency requests include Peninsula Commission on Homelessness, which is a joint exercise of power of six jurisdictions. This agreement remains at 2,759 per year. Nine of the applicants requested an increase in funding for fiscal year 2021. Taking in consideration the limits of the city's budget, we are recommending holding the funding level for all the applicants with the exception of one. Despite the fact that many agencies have not seen an increase in funding for two to three years, 
we are not recommending an increase with the exception of the House of Mercy. We recommend an increased funding to Williamsburg House of Mercy by $1,000 due to their homelessness services and crises assistance, as well as closely working with the Human Services Department. House of Mercy serves some of the most vulnerable populations in our community and provide assistance by providing food, transportation, and housing case management. Many times when individuals come to the Human Services Department, staff are coordinating services with House of Mercy to meet their needs. The committee also recommends considering funding for a new request from Housing Partnerships for $2,500. Housing Partnerships assists individuals who are limited in their financial resources and are in need of housing repairs, including roof, plumbing, and electrical repairs. Housing Partnerships has not applied for funding in previous years, which has limited their services to the city residents in the past. In summary, the Social Services Advisory Board has taken considerable amount of time to review the partnership agency requests. Our recommendation is to continue funding 14 agencies uh, with an increase to House of Mercy and would support the funding of a new applicant, Housing Partnerships. This total funding would amount to 461,650. We want to continue to support these nonprofit agencies and the incredible work they do for our community and its citizens. We want to thank you once again for the opportunity to conduct the review of the applicants and present you with our recommendations. Thank you, Mr. Nero. I'm going to come to my colleagues for any questions or comments. Uh, <clears throat> I don't have any, any questions, but uh, just really a, a comment to say thank you um, to all of the board who, who go through all of these uh, agencies and vet them. And, um, you know, when you see this list, it just reminds you of all the work that goes in to helping those in the community that, that need help the most and um, and I appreciate your recommendations on on, on the increases uh, hopefully we'll be able to see our way to, to make that happen so thank you for everything I'll pass on your your thanks to the board members madam chair thank you for being here today and for presenting um, I had a quick question and a quick comment um, in terms of delivering um, funding requests particularly for increases um, I'm looking on the third line with Avalon um, You've given them 19000 in the past. They've asked for a $1,000 increase to 20000 How are you able to, I guess, juggle the policy implications of whether to give someone like Avalon that does great work for domestic violence abuse victims uh, compared to someone like, let's say, House of Mercy, both of obviously equally uh, consequential nonprofits and do important work, but how do you really juggle along with, with We view that? the number of residents of Williamsburg that are being served. Uh, we also uh, view the, um, the, the cost per person. And we, we look at what James City is doing. We look at what your county is doing, how many their, of their citizens are being served, what they are giving versus what we are giving. That does not mean we do not think that Avalon is wonderful. And if you would like to give them that increase, right. That is fine with us. We realize that there is a, a, um, a tight budget, and you have many other things to consider, but uh, Avalon is a, a worthy cause, and uh, if you would like to review that further, we would be happy. I didn't mean to contest it. That was just an <laughs> illustration, because I know there's just so, so much limited resources, but so many great nonprofits out there. Yes. And this is just an illustration to folks who might be tuning in of the process. And, Obviously, some, sometimes the, the challenge of trying to find ways to accommodate everyone's request. It's not yes. easy. Um, in terms of my comment, I joined the vice mayor. I think it's important to, to remind everyone that we, don't, we have such limited staff in our health and human resources, and to be able to have the city give and contribute to wording agencies that actually specialize in areas that we otherwise would not do really so well in because of our limited staff. Uh, and to be able to find a way to contribute to these organizations so that they can continue to do their missions for city residents. Uh, that's really, I think, in sum, why this work is so important. And please pass along my, my thanks to, uh, to your committee. I will pass on the thanks thank you for to your the board work. members. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
So I would just like to also um, echo thanks for not only your thoughtful but your thorough review of all of the, the requests and uh, applaud you for considering housing partnerships because I think that if someone is able to get some assistance on the home they live in, then that provides them both time and funds to perhaps um, take more attention to, to other aspects of their lives. And so I think that's, that's very commendable. And you mentioned taking into account what James City County and York County did. Are you able to also take into account what other nonprofits do for funding of some of these agencies? Uh, we, we look at a variety of uh, different um, aspects. Uh, Wendy, did you want to add? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, yes, the agencies submit a, a budget and where the funding is, um, where they receive their funding. So the board members look closely at that. And to reference back, um, they also provide a pretty thorough narrative of the services they provide and what programming they're going to begin. So that is all taken con in consideration when uh, funding. Thank you. Uh, yes, thanks for your review. Uh, do you ever get uh, uh, requests for one-time programs that we might look at in a different light in terms of the ongoing requests? We were limited to the, the ones on the list, um, so um, if that should change, um, that, that hasn't as of yet, but uh, no. I'm, I'm thinking, of not, I mean, not, I'm not changing the list, but in terms of if they have a, a program like they want a, a one-time infusion to start something and, and they won't be coming back the following year. So I, I think, maybe I understand your question, I'm not sure, but if you're saying an agency already on the list has a program that they want to try that's a one-time thing, what they would do is in their request letter outline that that's something that they want to do and that would be a basis for an increase. Right. And it would be considered as part of the whole. Okay, thanks. So I, I too would just like to express my appreciation for all the work that goes into making the decisions, sometimes tough decisions, about how to allocate limited resources for a number of organizations that do tremendous work within our community. Several years ago, uh, I was approached by a resident who said, I don't understand why you take my tax money and you decide to give it to nonprofits when I could just give that money myself. And of course, I encouraged that resident to do that. But I explained, and this goes along to what Mr. Zhang was pointing out, we're investing in existing infrastructure to amplify the impact of these funds in a way the city could never apply with the structure that we have. So if we can infuse some resources into some of these organizations and help them do that much more for the people in our community, it's far greater than we could ever do on our own. So that's why we put this money towards these entities that are all charitable and will accept donations from the public if anybody's interested in providing that. So thanks again to you and your committee. Thank you, Mayor Farley. Thanks. So our, our next uh, presentation is from the Williamsburg Area Arts Commission. Just waiting to see who comes up. <laughs> hey, Joanna. Hi. Um, Mr. Mayor and members of council, it's my pleasure to introduce this year's Chair of the Arts Commission, Patricia Rubline. Um, the, this group of volunteers works very hard year-round to identify and strengthen uh, the arts in our region while also encouraging its education, growth, and accessibility. And we're very thankful and fortunate to have their expertise, expertise right here in this community. So. Welcome, Ms. Rubline. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm on a sort of a thin voice. I hope it doesn't disappear in the middle of my statement, but um, I'm uh, here with a few colleagues. Uh, we have three commissioners here with us today. Uh, Georgiana Avioli, if you would stand please, and Barbara Vollmer, uh, and Nick Vratos. Mrs. Vollmer is from the city and the other two people are from James City. <clears throat> And um, it's really nice to be able to speak to you about what the Arts Commission has been doing and how we contribute to that part of the local economy. Um, I, the Commission's had a really active year and uh, we began in fiscal year 20 uh, with 31 grantees and they offer a very wide variety of programming included our major companies in opera and orchestra, choral performance, drama, and the fine arts, all offering local events. 
Also, there's a healthy number of programs in arts education with our youth orchestra, <clears throat> harp, flute, accordion, and fine arts for our younger and challenged citizens. Many groups take performance and educational opportunities into the classroom, and audiences continue to grow. The Commission is always impressed by the annual reports from our grantees. They manage to do quite a lot, generally with a small budget. Um, that diversity I mentioned enhances our community and our educational programs. Variety also briefly summarizes the projects that are included in our fiscal year 21 request. Although there are also 31 requests this time, uh, there are three new applications, uh, but three from last year who did not apply. So details of interest here. Um, I should say we have struggled a bit in the face of um, our projected $11,000 reduction in funds. For fiscal year 20, we were funded $159,000 and had $209,525 in requests. This year, there are $217,050 in requests with only $149,000 assured. So we've been in touch with uh, other, the, uh, your matching partner, James City County, and we're working on possible resolutions to that shortfall. But in a burst of optimism, we submitted two budgets. We have Project A and Project B. Um, you have that in front of you. So as you peruse the various requests, you will note that while individual grant requests have gone up from last year, we are in both budget options able to offer less than last year's awards in several cases. In our review, especially to be fair in our deliberations, budget B would equal funding from fiscal year 20, and we are hopeful that that will be resolved for fiscal year 21, that we would maybe achieve level funding. <clears throat> Venues um, have been a, become a problem for uh, several of our grantees, um, both for scheduling and also for meeting higher rent costs. I should point out here that we have a few groups scheduling their events out of Williamsburg, James City County. This is outside the boundaries of our uh, requirements for funding but owing to lack of appropriate space for particularly dance groups. Um, in those cases, we have set, we've recommended funding, but we've set conditions to help us get informed about local attendance at those events. Uh, we, we will need to know how many of our local residents are traveling to those performances. <clears throat> So other additions we are pleased to note are the successes of our first two fall workshops. Um, we do these for our grantees. The first one was extremely successful because there was an opportunity for the grantees to meet each other and to find out, you know, to get to know each other for the first time. This past October, we programmed a short session on grant writing and a session entitled Boot Up Your Brand and that was led by Gretchen Bedell, who is the owner of Odd Moxie and well known in the field of social media, which was a request from the grantees. This program was well received, as you can see. I've provided you a handout with the evaluations from that event. And we've increased our administrative request to support the expenses expenses of those future fall programs. We would like to do that every year. Additionally, I want to mention that our liaison program has expanded and it is more clearly defined. And there's a description there of what we have uh, adapted. With the expansion of our commissioner liaisons, we have broader communication with our grantees, a clear information contact, and more active attendance at events. Um, it helps us to know what mid-year we are aware that the grantees are doing what their grants promised they would do. 
So because of our proximity and overlap of funding for many York County groups, we continue to hold our annual joint meeting with the York County Arts Commission. And this coming June, it is our turn to host that event. And you will be receiving an invitation to that. And hope if you have suggestions for topics, for speakers, whatever, uh, we have some ideas, but we'd welcome your suggestions as well. So in its work, the commission is eager to support and to help grow that value-added and value-driven asset, that aspect of the arts and culture component of our economy. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Ruboli. I'll come to my colleagues for questions and comments. But again, no, no questions specifically, but uh, just a general thank you for all the work that you all do. I know it is uh, very time consuming. Uh, you all put a lot of effort into to evaluating these and working with the different applicants one on one, uh, but then as a group. And so I know it's, it takes a lot of effort, and I'm glad we have uh, Joanna Scorbala, who's there to assist you all. It's to, been wonderful. To, to keep you all uh, going. Um, well, we love it. <laughs> so. Well, you know, and, and I think I think the community loves it. We're we're better off when we were able to to fund uh, these cultural activities that that you know broaden um, you know our thinking and, and challenges our thinking. And so I think it's a, it's a good good that we are able to support it. So thank you. It's nice to hear that. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful presentation and for you and your committee members to take time out of their day to sit here at the city council meeting and tuning in. Um, appreciate, certainly appreciate all the hard work y'all have done to, to present this today. Um, just as a matter of housekeeping for us, which budget should we look to? I guess it's A now, but is there a reasonable expectation that we may know of budget B by the time we consider the budget for adoption? Or? Well, I, I think uh, we've, we've got some conversations coming up in the next month, and hopefully um, that there will be some matching effort for budget B. Uh, Mr. City Manager, I mean, if, if talks go beyond the adoption of the budget, would that new, I guess, budget B come in the form of a budget amendment with yes. some future city council? I mean, so our process is I will deliver a proposed budget in April, right. uh, technically the end of the month, and then present it to you in April. And then we have from then until adoption to make changes. Once it's adopted, any change would require a budget amendment. Because I would think if you're able to reconcile and find a way to, to make up for the shortfall that we would honor that. Uh, okay. But that's, I'll leave that largely to how city staff will navigate through that. Thank right. you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rupline, for your presentation as my other colleagues have said I think we all value what arts brings to the community both for the educational aspect and for community residents but I also think that a certain number of these are very important for drawing visitors to Williamsburg and so that's very important to us for our tourism um, and increasing that so something like occasion for the arts I mean it's it's a, a full weekend and it provides us to say education and other ways for people to see Williamsburg and stay and spend money while they're here so um, I agree that we'll try and do as best we can to meet your budget request B. <laughs> thank you appreciate that uh, thank you I appreciate uh, the funding purpose notes too I think that's very helpful yes in terms of explaining things. Uh, any updates on Muscarelli uh, Museum of Art? At one point they were talking about exhibiting in Merchant Square, and I'm not sure if they're doing that or what are they doing now. They may be planning something outdoors. I don't have anything uh, from them on that uh, specifically, but um, they, they've had the uh, studio above the former William Sonoma. Um, but and they've had their artist in residence working up there with a lot of uh, community-wide programs. They've brought in a lot of school groups and uh, citizens, adult citizens, to to engage in art projects. Uh, I just don't know what will happen in Merchant Square at this point because I haven't been told, and they are not a grantee at this time. And they did not put in a request, right? No. Um, the, um, I think the issue is that they're in the process of making their strategic planning, too. 
No, thank you. Okay. I, too, would like to add my thanks. I, I don't think most residents appreciate the time and effort that goes into what you do, not only in, in making these decisions on grant recommendations, but the follow-up, the personal attendance at these programs to see if the program really is as you thought it was when you received the grant request, and then to evaluate the way that investment played out in the community. And as um, Ms. Ramsey mentioned, it's great opportunity to provide cultural benefits to residents. It's a draw for tourists. It's also arts education for children in this community in a number of respects. But I, something else that potentially gets overlooked is the opportunity for the adult participants in these <coughs> programs to benefit from having an outlet for their creative juices and, and to do that in front of an audience. And so the, the benefits really uh, wrap around everyone. Yes, I, I often say to groups that one of the nicest things about having an orchestra is that the musicians teach our children. So there's a lot of, as I say, value-driven uh, advantage to that. And thanks for your, everybody's uh, on the Arts Commission's continued effort to guide the applicants through the process to help them be as successful as they can because in years past at times it was a struggle for some to complete the paperwork properly. So having these workshops and then helping them in other ways is really terrific. It still is. We're still having challenges getting them to submit a balanced budget, you know, those kinds of things. Um, it, they're, frequently they're writer, the grant writer is a person who's never written a grant before. And that's one of the things we hope to cover in more detail in the fall at our workshop. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Our third presentation today is by the Williamsburg Regional Library. We have with us today Library Director Betsy Fowler. I have a quick question before she gets up. Um, there was a presentation regarding the tourism fund. Is that later or because it's put in the same block of the agenda items? Oh, no. The, what we did was we tried to give you all of the background on outside agency requests, including the money that would be coming from the tourism fund, but there's no presentation on that today. So we'll talk about that during budget. Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you for pointing that out. Sure. Welcome, Ms. Fowler. Thank you, good afternoon, members of city council, city manager, city staff, and thank you for the opportunity to come and talk about the library and the library's budget requests this year. Synced up. Here we are. So, the Williamsburg Regional Library proposed budget for 2021. I wanted to discuss some of the highlights and some of the trends that we're seeing at the library that are driving the budget. Um, what's really trending at the library is programs, programs, programs. So the library continues, books continue to be the backbone of the library. We're still checking out 1.1 million items a year. We're still answering reference questions, doing story times, doing all the normal things the library has done so well for decades. But we are also offering an increased number of programming and we have a big demand for programming from many of our seniors who are anxious to continue to learn from um, families and children and from teens. So the staff is working very hard to deliver a greater repertoire of programs all the time and the Friends of the Library have been working very hard to fund this greater repertoire of programs. And last year they funded 176,000. Um, the majority of that went to programs and then a few other things that I'll mention. And you can see the numbers um, are reflecting the public response to this. We had 127,000 programs program attendees um, in the last fiscal year. And that's in addition to 29,000 members of the public who use the meeting room spaces that were not attending library programs, but were using spaces in the library. Um, and I wanted to highlight some of the things that happened. I put this together the week of, the first week of March, and I just looked back at the previous weekend at what had happened. And these are just activities that happened Friday, Saturday, Sunday, February 21st, 22nd, 23rd. So we had six people attending an Italian language learning class, five people attending a knitting, 70 people came to a talk about the life and legacy of Crazy Horse that the library sponsored. 
21 people came to the Getaway Cafe, which is for people with early memory loss and their caretakers to attend. Um, five people attended a career coaching um, class the library offered, and 105 people came to a Dewey Decibel concert. So that's what happened that Friday at the library. On Saturday, um, we had 12 people from the class of 69, six people attending a Bible study, 10 a Russian language class, 170 people attended my furry Valentine story time here at the Stryker Center, which was a little frightening for the one librarian who was doing the program and her son who was in a dog costume. And 170 people came, so that was a very robust attendance. Um, 25 people came to weaving, and 180 people attended a STEAM program at James City County Library um, looking at the stars that night. And then that Sunday, we had 82 people who meet regularly every Sunday at the Incarnation Church Sunday morning. The State Department uses us um, a couple of times a month to conduct interviews. 12 people came to a library-sponsored chess club, and 193 people attended the Black History Month concert at the Williamsburg Library Theater. So you can see how we get to those numbers of 127,000 program attendees a year with just what's happening in a three-day period here at the library. And it also establishes why the library is such an important anchor and driver for the downtown and downtown vibrancy with that many things happening. Um, oh, and I left off AARP, which served 114 people at both locations. And these were some of the big signature programs that the Friends are helping us fund. We're calling them signature because they usually are designed to attract between three and 600 people and we have big turnouts. Um, this was our summer reading kickoff, our second one that we had out at the newly named City Square. And we had 500 people come. We had big slides and clowns and face painting and it was an all day event that was very popular. Um, we did a, what we called the year of making. The library doesn't have a maker space per se, which is very common in libraries now where you have an area where people can create and make different types of objects and learn about them. But we are using this building um, and rolling our equipment out on a regular basis to do these types of programs. And we had a maker fair that kind of encompassed all of them in the building last September. Um, Star Wars Reads Day. We had a big Harry Potter event here on December 14th that 500 people attended at Stryker. Um, the Ford's Colony Railroad Show was here for the first time. And we had our first one book, one community read, which was part of our collaboration with William and Mary. And we went in together. We used the freshman read book there, there. The foundation, Library Friends Foundation, paid for multiple copies, so we had over 300 copies in circulation. The book groups read it, many of them. Um, the college paid the majority of the cost of the author, and then the Friends pitched in some. And we had 360 people attend, so we filled the theater, and then we had an overflow crowd of 70-some people here in the Stryker Center watching it. Um, on the screen. So it was a great success where we were really excited about how many people participated and how excited people were and involved. We did a lot of programming before and after it about Native American Indians and their issues and showed the film Alcatraz twice. And the community really enthusiastically embraced it. And it was a tough book. It wasn't an easy read. So it really reflected well on the community that they were able to um, really become involved with that topic. Um, this was another big program we did that I mentioned that weekend in February of exploring the night sky. And then we have a big event coming up here, April 4th at City Square, which is a wisteria festival, which is kind of celebrating nature and spring and the beautiful wisteria. And we're having butterfly tents and the little animals and the garden clubs and lots of other activities happening, naturalists speaking. So we're looking forward to that. Um, we're also focusing a lot on cultural experiences and connections, so the library book groups, the ongoing lectures, film series, concerts, and art exhibits fall under that. Um, and here's some pictures in our Beyond the Shelves, um, which is our program guide, which the friends are now paying half the cost of producing, which is very helpful. Um, and the library is really focusing on learning experiences. We've really learned from doing these big STEAM programs that people want 
intergenerational experiences where they can sit down with their grandchildren and their children and learn about science or learn to do a craft or learn a new skill and that these are very popular. So we are doing more and more in that direction. You see our 3D printer up on the left. The second slide is a pair of seniors at one of the retirement communities that we visit experiencing virtual reality. Um, and we have, of course, our upcoming um, ideas, Kiwanis Kids Idea Studio feature, which I'll talk more about in a minute. Wi-Fi hotspots are a new thing the library is doing. Again, the friends are paying for it, where we are, you can check out for a week a hotspot, and it will um, enable you to use up to 15 different um, computers or gadgets at your home and have internet access. So if you're a family that doesn't have internet access, it gives you that availability. And then of course the art space here. And just as a follow up to a comment you all made earlier, I believe that Steve Prince, who is the visiting auth auth artist in residence, will be here April 4th and he is going to do another exhibit here at Stryker. He had a very successful one last year. So we're excited he's coming back. Um, and this is our idea studio, Qantas Kids Idea Studio, that's opening up March 21st, and we hope you all can attend. It has a lot more than what you see here. It has the village. It has um, awesome air tubes machine. It has all sorts of interactive science exhibits for families to do together and different activities for children to do. And it's really the direction we're trying to move in terms of being a learning center for the community. Um, this is kind of groundbreaking. I don't know of any other library that has embraced this scope of learning activities inside of their collection space. So we're very proud of it, very excited. The Friends raised $225,000 to make this possible. In addition to CIP funds from um, James City County. And so we're really hoping this turns out to be something that will be very successful, that we'll learn from this project and be able to reproduce this in Williamsburg, and that this will in turn enhance this library and the community and people attending here from out of the area as well. Um, last year, we really focused on kind of reimagining the use of City Square. We held Fun Fest Fridays where children, we rolled out all the games and the children played on Fridays. We had music on City Square for lunch, a brown bag lunch on Thursdays. We boosted the Wi-Fi and then of course um, added some furniture and the city gave us a tourism grant this year to add permanent Adirondack chairs too. We also um, added new branding. We've got a new logo. We've got a new website up this year. And we have an app that you can go to the App Store and download. It's very handy. You can put your library card number in it and never have to bring your card again. You can just hold it up when you check out. You can reserve books. You can scan an ISBN code at the bookstore, and it will instantly tell you if the library owns that book. And you can place a hold on it right there at the bookstore and come and pick the book up. So that's very exciting. We also have online payment of fines and fees for the first time. And we're working on RFID, which is a radio frequency device checkouts, which will make our checkouts and check-ins much more efficient for the public and much more efficient in terms of operations. So um, for the entire community, we had 550,000 total library visits. Um, of which 369,000 were Williamsburg. Really, if you count with Stryker, it was almost 400,000, 385,000. Um, we had 1.14 checkouts. Um, we had 155,000 items reserved. The friends are helping us buy multiple copies, which is helping a lot to address that need, which averages 3,123 checkouts each day of the year. And I just thought this was interesting. This is a new Gallup poll you may have seen that just came out that shows that the average American visits the library 10 times a year, more than they go to movie theaters, sporting events, concerts, or museums. Um, we got the star rating, which we're very excited about this year. So, um, and that is based on actual data that's turned into the state library and then to the federal government. And it ranks us in the top 4% of libraries in the United States. Um, this is our actual budget request. Um, there is um, 
a compensation increase of around a little over 100,000. A lot of that's being driven by whatever numbers James City County comes in in terms of their VRS and health package. And those numbers have not been determined yet. Um, so this is an estimate that's gone in. But once this budget goes out to the jurisdictions, we don't come back and ask for more. Um, this is pretty much it. If it ends up being greater than the amount we've asked, we have to resolve it through fund balance. Um, our collections, we've just asked for a 20,000 increase, and that's to pay for the increased costs of ebooks. I don't know if you're aware that the publishing world has kind of been locking horns with the library world over the last few years, and now they're charging us licensing for the ebooks as well as greatly inflated costs for the ebooks. So we pay for them, and then we have to pay for them again each year. So that's turned out to be an expensive, though very popular um, part of what we're doing. The operational costs are up around 170, and most of that is being driven by a technology fund we're establishing because we had to replace our entire data center last year um, at one time. It was in pretty bad condition and had not been upgraded for years. The library has not had a technology fund in the past to do upgrades with and therefore had not been doing them regularly. So now we're seeking to get on a five-year cycle so that we can build up the funds and replace it in a timely way so we don't fall behind again. The total budget increase is 5% across the board. That's, I mean, total for all the jurisdictions combined. That's the most that we're allowed to ask for under the contract. Um, the city of Williamsburg, though, is only 3.92% because James City County's piece of the pie continues to expand as their population expands, which means your piece of the pie continues to be, be smaller. Um, you see state aid is reflected in this number now. Um, the res where it says WRL reserve funds, that 72,000 was used to fund the second phase of the evergreen um, um, costs for staff um, raises to bring the staff in line with compensation packages around the region. That was the second year. It came in, that number came in after our budget request last year, so we weren't able to include it in our budget last year, but now it's embedded in this year's jurisdictional budgets. The money we generate, and then the total. And um, one of the reasons we're Star Library is because we have wonderful jurisdictions that support us and support, have supported this library very well for decades and it has made this library the library that it is. So thank you very much. If there's any questions, I can answer. Thank you, Ms. Fowler. Let's come to my colleagues for yeah. questions or comments. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Fowler. Um, you know, I really appreciate all the, the information that you provided us in terms of programming. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day about future potentials of, you know, renovating a library or expanding it or rebuilding it and they were like, oh, why do you need to do that? Nobody goes to libraries anymore and, and clearly this person um, is not in, in that, didn't participate in a Gallup poll. Um, <laughs> but, um, it's more than just checking out books. It's more than just having a, the resources there to, to go get something. It's, it's all of these other things. And, right. um, and so I, I applaud those efforts to expand the programming because as you point out, it is essential to the downtown vibrancy and having people in the area that that can come in and, and take advantage of your services but then the services that are offered in other local businesses or even just the historic area and so um, it really is a, a, an integral part of the of the overall puzzle that is Williamsburg so I appreciate that um, but in terms of um, distribution of books and that type of stuff obviously we're switching it's a lot of it's online, as I think you pointed out, there's an 8% right. increase in, in digital stuff. That's right. Um, is that true for the physical books and records and music and movies and all that stuff? Are we seeing? It is. It is. Um, what we saw this year is that the physical checkouts overall are kind of holding steady but not growing. And within that, some are going down and some are going up. For instance, DVDs are slowly going down because everybody has, so many people have moved to streaming. Um, but yet, the actual physical books themselves have gone up, the fiction and nonfiction, interestingly. Um, but the real growth is in the digital. It's the streaming movies, which the friends have been paying for us to have, the documentaries and foreign films. It's the recorded books, 
um, that people are downloading and ebooks. So that's really where the biggest growth is. And so when you also point out there be a, a a slight decline, only $2,000 in funds that you generate. Is that a result of, maybe you can t talk about it, I would imagine, you know, when you check something out digitally, it expires. You're exactly right. right? That's so right. There's no, there's no fines um, with digital items because it automatically uh, disappears off your device, and so there is a gradual decrease in the amount of fine money that we're collecting. Great. Well, thank you for everything that you've uh, presented today and the work that you and your team have done to, to make the library what it is and to have this, this ranking. Uh, uh, you know, certainly, as Mayor, Fr uh, Mayor Hallman used to say, this is, you know, a crown jewel, um, and it is. It is. Um, and so, but thank Great you for all your efforts. Thank you. Doug will never admit this, but I'm sure he's one of those guys that visits the library ten times a year to read books. <laughs> take you Programming. A, you strike, yeah, that's right. You strike me as a guy. I don't, that I don't check that. out much. <laughs> um, just had a couple questions. So just to be clear, with the proposed FY 2021 proposed, um, sorry, the budget expenditures, um, the, the total 5%, that's a number that's kind of floating around and you're trying to lock down or are you just specifically talking about compensation? That, no, that is the total um, library budget increase system-wide. And that's something you're trying to figure out? No, we figured it out. It is, okay. it is that okay, 5%. So going, we, okay. can't, we can't go beyond that. The contract specifies that's the ceiling. Okay. Um, the big drivers, we don't have any new positions this year or anything like that. The big drivers are wrapping in that second year of Evergreen um, compensation package, which we funded previously out of fund balance and trying to add this technology fund. And the technology fund is also probably where we'll have to balance the budget funds from that if James City County's um, health costs and um, VRS costs come in higher than we've estimated. Sure. So. And explain to me in the next slide with the um, Williamsburg Regional Library Reserve Funds, is that like a a separate reserves line item, or is that the reserve fund? We have a fund balance that I think is around 1.8, okay. and a lot of that is designated funds. It's funds the board has set aside in case we lose state funding, which sure. is, as you can see, 325000 It's also funds that are designated if, for some reason, the system were to collapse for whatever reason and the debts that would be owed that we would have to pay out. And then we have another, um, I think it's roughly 250000 that's not designated that stays there. And this is also where most of our capital expenses come out of. We pay for our new bookmobile, our vehicles, the technology money has come out of, come out of there historically. So. Sure. And uh, wonderful partnerships with multiple stakeholders clearly evident through your slides here, um, but can you explain to me kind of the, the partnerships that you guys have, whether it's programming or some other efforts with our William & Mary library systems, um, if any? Yes, well they've been terrific to work for. Carrie Cooper, who is the Dean of Libraries for William & Mary, has been a wonderful uh, collaborator, so we were able to reach a memorandum of understanding where anybody that lives in the jurisdictions that participate in the library can now check up to 11 items at a time out of William and Mary, which is a real, a really wonderful thing because it's one of the top um, university libraries in the United States, and it really adds a real dimension if you are a scholar or somebody who is just an interested reader pursuing something to be able to use as resources. Um, we are going together with them with trainings with our staff. Um, we are looking this summer at going together and offering a series on African American genealogy, which their genealogists are going to come do here at Williamsburg and at Grove. Um, we are um, attending the Lemon event with them um, next Friday, which we're looking for, forward to. We're going to continue to do the One Book, One Community Read. So we're really excited about all the potential for building on a partnership with them. And it's, it's just uh, clearly a, a, a point that we have in this community. A lot of community partners who are willing to, to really good. work with other um, important stakeholders like the library. I know WHRO, we have, we're really blessed to have a right. public presence here right. in Williamsburg and home base here uh, in conjunction with the public school divisions that funds at WHRO. I'm, I'm glad to see that programming thrive under your directorship. And just a common point, um, I think 
I think you've exemplified what a 21st century library really should look like. You know, I, to, to Doug's point before, some folks may ask, what is the relevancy of these libraries anymore? And I think you've shown them a way. So hopefully other libraries will be inspired by your model. Right. But uh, in terms of a personal appreciation, I'm sure it extends with the rest of us on this council is um, your willingness and your role to find a space for the library to contribute to downtown vibrancy, whether it is reimagining City Square, which has sat fairly vacant for years, and you found a way to make that space work. And it's no doubt uh, funneled into our conversations about what we can do to improve downtown vibrancy, and we owe that all to you and to your wonderful board and also your friends. Of, and the uh, staff does a tremendous staff, job. It's a, it's a yeah. big collaborative effort with a lot of people. Thank you. But I really believe, too, the library has kind of untapped potential to some degree because we know um, that um, the lack of space and the lack of parking is kind of truncating how many people could be coming here. So we realize that there's a potential to even serve a lot more people if we had um, the space and the parking to Thank you. serve them. Yes. Uh, thank you, Betsy. I don't have too much to add, but I will just uh, take a, a little bit on that last comment you made about space, because I know you mentioned that you would like to replicate the Kiwanis Kids Idea mm -hmm. space mm -hmm. here, but I think there are a couple constraints with the library um, right. as far as, as space. Right, right. And, uh, and we too, like Mr. Zhang said, have talked about the 21st century library and all the different programming options. And I think it was um, Vice Mayor Pons who talked about people coming to the library for the various programming or to check out a book and then stay in downtown to eat. And that came out loud and clear, I believe, in the survey. It really did. It really um, did. As far as, as doing that. And I tried to check out the There There book uh, as a download you know, ebook, and there weren't any copies available. So, oh, I'm sorry I'm to hear that. But that's okay. <laughs> I, I did get a number of other ebooks uh, added to my Kindle. It was the first time I'd ever done that. Oh, good. And okay. the little Libby app was that's right. was very that's right. easy to to utilize, even for me. So, uh, really appreciate and glad that it all went well. And uh, the collaboration really stands out too, whether it be with William and Mary or NASA and, and different stakeholder groups in the area. So. Thank, Thank you, you for all you're doing for the library and, and the city of Williamsburg. Thank you. Uh, thank you. How important is uh, having the auditorium and the theater there? Really important. Um, we not only use it for a lot of library programming, a lot of the children's programs are happening in it, whether it's the Battle of the Books or even the big story times. You saw that 170 people came to a Clifford dog story time. But um, we really need one at James City County as well. That's what we've realized because because we don't have one up there. Frequently, we have to hold the same event two or three times in one day to get everybody seated. So having it for library programs is essential, but it also drives a lot of people from the community here um, that come to the library that probably wouldn't come if they didn't have special events or movies or other things they were doing, and then they combine that with other library use and shopping downtown. So I think the, the theater was a brilliant idea back in the 80s because it was really kind of groundbreaking at the time to add that to a library. And now I see a li lot of libraries emulating that. Ronette County just built something very similar based on Williamsburg's library. Um, and so it's a great asset. If you were able to snap your fingers and add some space, which age group would you uh, program that for? You know, I'd have to, you know, there's, I, I think the teens are the biggest problem I see, that we really don't have a teen room, we don't have a teen space, we don't have technology for teens, and when you go to the new libraries, you see how they have really carved out big areas for teens to be able to study and collaborate and create media content. I think the creation collaboration piece is really struggling here because we don't have the breakout rooms or the spaces for people to be able to create content and work on projects together. Um, I think we're clearly lacking that creator maker space that's become very popular in libraries. Um, and I think what we see, uh, you know, I saw that number 155,000 holds. I think a lot of people who are readers here have kind of developed a thing where they 
they look at the catalog, they put things on hold, they pull into the five minute parking, they run in and get their hold and they come back out and leave. And that's kind of because there's really not a lot of seating space in the library. There's no place where you're gonna go and kind of have that living room area with the fireplace and the comfortable chairs that a lot of libraries are featuring that makes people really linger in the space. So people have kind of acclimated to using this library by just kind of using it in a very efficient way but not really going in and using the spaces. Strikers really helped because I don't know where we'd be without the additional space here to kind of be pushing out into with the programming, but um, we're still struggling. Uh, and I think we're struggling too because of the security issues um, in the building and the aging infrastructure and access issues are problematic. Thank you. Well, congratulations on the star rating. Oh yeah, we're really excited. It really is Very terrific. Excited. Um, earlier, you mentioned that the city's piece of the pie is smaller. Yes. When you say that, you mean in proportion to James City County's piece, because our piece is still growing as the whole pie That's is right. growing. Oh, That's right. Sure. That's right. That's right. Their piece of the pie is growing faster because they're adding more people in their population right. base. Yes. Um, <clears throat> other thing I, I wanted to just emphasize, well, you touched on it briefly, the summer reading program long been a favorite of mine. Um, my children were able to go through it. Then they were able to volunteer with it afterwards. Uh, just a, a great opportunity to project the library's reach out of the library and into the home where right. you involve the entire family because you're bringing your children in, you're listening to them talk about the books when they come right. in, and then you help them pick out new ones to bring back. So, uh, I mean, the more we can do to promote literacy in the community as well as provide all these events and activities, I think the better off our community will be as a result. So thanks to you and your entire team. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. We have one more presentation today and for this one I will pass the gavel over to Vice Mayor Pons. As an employee of the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, it's probably not appropriate that I comment on this specific request. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, I believe we have Mr. Duncan here from Clinton Williamsburg. Welcome. Thank you. Am I driving this? I just need some instruction. <laughs> Forward. Okay, that's easy. Mr. Vice Mayor and members of City Council, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Jeff Duncan, Vice President of Real Estate at Colonial Williamsburg, and I'm joined by my colleagues Robert Underwood, Vice President of Operations, and Anna Cordell Harry, Community Affairs Manager. We are also here representing the hundreds of our colleagues who work tirelessly on the events for which we are here to request funding. And thank you for this opportunity to present information about Colony Williamsburg's request for financial support for the many events we expect to hold during the city's upcoming fiscal year that will be free and open to the public and financial support for inf infrastructure improvements necessary for us to support the crowds attracted to these events. We believe our ability to present and support these public events is critical to the portion of our mission dedicated to sharing the stories about life and celebrations in 18th century Williamsburg, to how those stories relate to modern America, and to sharing locally and regionally everything 21st century Williamsburg has to offer. For us, along with much, much more that we do, these take the form of annual grand illumination and Independence Day celebrations, summer breeze concerts, and holiday decorations and entertainment, offered within the backdrop of Colonial Williamsburg's historic area, Merchant Square, our beautiful buildings and streetscapes, and all presented in a comfortable and convenient setting. For the city of Williamsburg, the tens of thousands attending these public events also means tens of millions of dollars in sales for our downtown establishments and generation of millions of dollars in room, meal, and sales taxes. For fiscal 2021, Colonial Williamsburg is requesting the city of Williamsburg reinvest $1.3 million in support of these events and improvements to the infrastructure necessary to support them. We will walk through the individual items that make up our request, but this page serves to summarize them. Grand Illumination, Logistics and Fireworks, Independence Day, Summer Breeze Concerts, 
public facilities upgrades, streetscape improvements, holiday entertainment and decorations, and potable water for guests. These add up to $1,360,000, and we are, our request is for $1.3 million. The next two slides summarize the overall economic impact of spending by visitors to Colonial Williamsburg annually. <laughs> Approximately $3.9 million is collected directly by Colonial Williamsburg annually in rooms, meals, and the local portion of sales taxes with ultimate remittance to the city of Williamsburg. Colonial Williamsburg also pays the city $2.2 million in real estate and property taxes. We estimate state sales tax collections in Greater Williamsburg total $8.9 million as a result of visitation to Colony Williamsburg, along with $9.7 million in room, meals, and local sales taxes. With respect to individual segments of our request for support, we have included $210,000 total for Grand Illumination and Independence Day. While somewhat alike in the size of the crowds, uh, running 35 to 40,000 at each event, the nature of Grand Illumination requires slightly higher costs than Independence Day due to multiple fireworks sites, the all-day entertainment throughout the historic area, and increased costs for security. We have included $50,000 for support of the annual Summer Breeze concerts. Summer Breeze concerts have been held in and around Merchant Square for 30 years. Three years ago, we expanded the number of weekly concerts to 16 from eight and moved the concert site from Duke of Gloucester Street to the lawn, uh, the much more comfortable lawn of the museums of Colony Williamsburg, with the result being crowd sizes tripling. This move also increased costs associated with the concerts, including higher costs for entertainment and the addition of security and extra restroom facilities. Last year, we reduced the number of concerts from 16 to 12 and expect to sponsor 12 concerts again this year. As with the expansion of the Summer Breeze concerts, we have expanded the holiday entertainment throughout Merchant Square beginning in mid-November with the opening of the Ice Pavilion and extending through the end of the year. 45 days of entertainment um, and wreath making and music. My colleague Robert Underwood will provide additional information about the infrastructure improvements that we that are needed now in support of our ability to provide these events free and open to the public and afterwards we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have Just hit that arrow. well good afternoon thank you for having us and having the opportunity to present our uh, projects and and funding needs uh, the next three projects that i will cover are priority projects that are supported by comments and feedback that we have received from the community and our guests. Uh, restrooms being one of the top priorities uh, on our list that we get uh, comments back uh, on. Uh, some of the comments that we've received over the years are that we have limited capacity uh, due to uh, the design and the age of the facility access uh, that can be difficult in some of our facilities and we have um, a need more a, a need uh, of family style and uh, special needs accommodations uh, the scope uh, of the market square tavern which is the priority area that we're looking at right now because it is one of the main entrances into the historic area uh, is it involves two buildings. It's the uh, Market Square Stable as well as the Up and Down Cottage. Uh, the existing restrooms are in Market Square Stable. Uh, and uh, we have relocated our military program from the Up and Down Cottage in preparation uh, to do this work. The scope of work includes uh, basically gutting the interiors of both of these buildings, uh, leaving the exteriors intact, uh, but gutting them to expand the restrooms. The Market Square uh, stable uh, would utilize the space that is currently occupied and used for our mechanical space, our vending machines, and uh, our, H our HVAC uh, equipment, and two family, uh, existing family rooms. And that would double the size 
uh, of those restrooms. When I say double the size, double the capacity is what I should say, not physically double the size, but double the capacity. The up and down cottage uh, would be converted to family style and special, special needs. It would include three family restrooms, one adult care room, and then also a sitting room that would be used for nursing and for uh, quiet rooms for those that may have autistic children and need a place uh, to go where it is quiet. It would also include redoing our uh, HVAC system for those facilities. The benefits that, uh, that it will provide is uh, for the community, or it will provide uh, comfort facilities between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. We have quite a few runners, walkers, and, and groups that are out and about early before our operation begin. Uh, it will include, run, or I mentioned the runners uh, before the operating hours, and also for events as Williamsburg Live, July 4th, and Grand Illumination, some that Jeff had already covered. Uh, it will benefit uh, Colonia Williamsburg in that it will uh, create a more welcoming environment, uh, better accommodation for our guests, and also put us into uh, starting to become a leader in the areas of these special needs for, uh, for our community and guests. Uh, and this is a, a first phase of a multiple phase uh, upgrade throughout the facilities. Um, for the street, for the streetscape, I'm <laughs> not getting it. There we go. I hit the wrong one. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, on a streetscape, uh, some again coming. Uh, being supported and setting it as a priority, some of the feedback that we've received over the years uh, has been that the historic area is just hot, uh, has very limited uh, shade. Uh, there have been safety issues uh, with slip trips and falls because of the condition uh, of the streets uh, before we started the uh, streetscape uh, work. And also the, uh, the storm, the wear and tear on the buildings and the, and the maintenance on the storm uh, system because of erosion issues. Uh, we, did, we did research that uh, brought us back to the 1930s, and you can see uh, with some of the before and after pictures, uh, the after pictures are, rep are replication of uh, what was done in the 30s when Mr. Rockefeller restored the town. Uh, the scope of work uh, for this project includes exposing the cobblestone, uh, inst uh, installing or, or placing a tough, a tough Bermuda sod, which is a uh, very resistant to foot traffic and uh, can hold up to the summers that we have here. Uh, includes irrigation to help maintain the landscape along the street uh, streets and also planting trees where where needed, and uh, and then also placing uh, benches. Uh, along the, the walkways as well. Again, the benefits are creating an inviting atmosphere for the community and our guests, controlling erosion, uh, keeping the stormwater system uh, from filling, excuse me, filling with sediment and sand, and uh, providing better access between the street and the walkways. Uh, we've uh, started to use some flatter uh, cobblestone to improve uh, those access. Uh, re and it, we have seen a reduction in slip trips and falls since we started this work and want to continue with that. Um, they are, it, will, it will help uh, with the wear and tear. We get a lot of, uh, of sand and buildup. It actually goes between the floorboards and we've actually had problems where it actually has built up between the floor and the ceiling uh, where it has caused damage to the buildings and we had to go in and, and repair that. Uh, the areas that we're looking for for uh, 2021 is to is between uh, cap the Capitol and Waller Street, and then starting some work on uh, the Palace Green. Uh, we do anti again anticipate that this will be phased, and we uh, eventually will have the historic area uh, upgraded with uh, with um, with the streetscape. The last, the last one that we have, uh, again, being supported uh, with comments from, uh, from the community and for, from our guests, is not having enough uh, 
water fountains and available water. And uh, with uh, today's guests and, uh, and the community is looking for uh, water fountains that they can refill their own bottles. Uh, which we uh, do anticipate uh, to start to install. And the first one would be at, uh, at our Market Square uh, Tavern restrooms. Uh, but this would include 20, approximately 20 locations throughout the historic area. Uh, and some of those would include uh, ticket sales area uh, around the taverns and Merchant Square. And again, this would benefit uh, not only our guests, but the, but the community as well. Good, thank you. Um, before I kick it off, off to my uh, colleagues, I just want to take a moment to, to thank you all for <coughs> kind of repositioning the ask from marketing dollars to uh, these projects that are tangible. Um, and I think in the past when it was marketing, it was hard for a lot of people in the community to, to really wrap their hands around the need you know, of, of supporting the foundation's marketing. Um, it's not tangible. Uh, so. I think what you've done here is, is provided, um, I think, clearly uh, a good argument um, to how these funds would be spent. Um, uh, you know, people, it's the city residents that take, you know, advantage of the fireworks and the Summer Breeze concert series and um, the work that you're doing on, on, on Duke of Gloucester Street in terms of the landscaping. Uh, thank you for taking the time to, to explain that to me because it makes much better sense. Um, I hadn't considered the wear and tear that the that gravel and sand had had created on on the buildings, and uh, so it makes sense that we would want to try to support an effort to to make sure that that doesn't continue. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll pass it on to Mr. Zhang. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Welcome, temporary <laughs> chair, sitting chair. Thank you, Robert, and then Jeff for for being here today, and also Anna for for. Um, presenting the, the Colonial Williamsburg tr triage here. Um, I think just to comment real briefly to, to what Vice Mayor Ponce has said, I think it is a remarkable shift in policy and I think it's one thing that will only generate more community goodwill. Um, you know, you're accounting for how the 1.3 million is going to be used and um, there's certainly a lot more buy-in but more importantly just the transparency I think is, is something that in this day and age folks expect of their government and also with one of the, the very large employers in the area. Um, so we certainly do appreciate that. Um, I do want to attribute it, this next comment to the city manager because he actually made a really good point in our briefing this morning. And with these funding requests, um, all of these fundings will go to improvements that the city will have done anyways. Um, whether it's streetscape improvements, whether it's improvements to public facilities, um, I think for some observers out there, they would see that some of these projects had appeared in tourism development fund applications and now they're seeing this here. Well, this kind of separates it in, in, in a way, also strengthens our existing tourism development fund. So that, where that provides an opportunity for us to continue seeking new tourism product and opportunities. And that's something certainly that we can do in partnership uh, with local stakeholders, with any other stakeholders, but also for this, provide a very clear funding line to continue to support Colonial Williamsburg's mission and also the city's dedication to the foundation. So appreciate that. That's a that's a, a, a good sign of, of continued relations with y'all. It's great to see familiar faces and a really good way to kickstart the new administration. Appreciate you being here today. Thank you. And I would like to echo both my colleagues' comments, particularly in regards to uh, the delineation of the projects that the money would be used for. I think it does help the community see where the money is, is going and the impact that it will have on all of us, whether it be for city residents or for visitors. And I think uh, it's also appreciated that a number of the projects really benefit health and safety whether, because I think we've all heard a lot of people say, oh, it's so hot in Williamsburg and there's no place and no shade and, and the trees are gone. And so knowing that you all are gonna really make an effort to provide more water and shade and new trees is, is well appreciated. Uh, I did have a couple questions. Uh, you mentioned the market tavern restrooms. Is that the only one that is going to be addressed or are there others for our, 700,000? Our intention is this would be phased over a number of years. In 2021, it would only be the, the market square tavern, though we are looking at uh, 
improving uh, the what we call the palace uh, restrooms, which is at the, near the Everard House. Uh, that has limited access to it, and it needs to be increased in size. So we're looking at, at options there going into, uh, into future years. But the first one we were looking at was Market Square. But to answer your question, it, it would be multiple locations. Right, because I think a lot of people would think that $700,000 for, for one building and restroom access might be a, a little heavy and so it's nice to hear that it would be others under consideration and that would also include the water fountains I believe in that budget amount right that, that was a separate that was a separate line item okay and I for one am glad to hear that it would be the water fountains we talked about that this morning that one could fill your own bottle with I, uh, I, I would like to clarify though that the market square is the, the full 700 um, oh. It is for the two buildings, and it's quite extensive, the work that needs to be done there. It would require the floors to be removed and new services put in for the new layout of the buildings. So I just I wanted to make that clear. Okay. And um, as far as the summer breeze, um, I know you were commenting about you know, the move and the change and the increased security and all of that. How has that been funded in the past? I'm going to let Jeff answer that one. Colonial Williamsburg funded that entirely. We, um, we did uh, solicit a few sponsorships to help offset some of the costs, but um, we fund that entirely, and um, the costs have just grown over the last couple of years as we've moved it over to the museums. We engaged Culture Fix to help us uh, put on the events, and they brought in uh, food vendors and uh, beer tents, and that also helped offset some of the overall costs. Because I think the city yes. provided some money. Right. We, we have provided some funding for the Summer Breeze Concert Series to Culture Fix directly. The EDA provided a $2,500 sponsorship, so a small percentage of the doll. Just trying to get an idea of what who had been helping in the past and, and for this amount. So I think that was the only questions I had. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, yeah, we're fortunate to have Colonial Williamsburg uh, sponsor these public events, especially the fireworks. Uh, uh, I know in New England, a similar tourist town, it's the town that actually pays for those uh, fireworks. So. And uh, we could look at this as a reimbursement versus a grant where you know, we would reimburse for actual expenses. I think in this year we're talking about a, a grant uh, when you come back to us next year, what type of accounting will we get, be getting for these costs? Um, we will report back exactly against the projects, and how much was spent <clears throat> against those exact projects, and we'll probably come back with a similar request for similar projects again next year. But I want to be accountable to what we've requested this year and be able to show you next year what the actual spending was. Okay. So we've been talking a lot about... Uh, downtown vibrancy and of course one of the deterrents to downtown vibrancy is the empty Goodwin building. Why not use some of this money to jumpstart that project? Uh, good question. <laughs> uh, don't have an answer for you on that specifically but um, we're considering lots of options for you. Yeah so under the lease with the city for the uh, municipal parking lots uh, Colonial Williamsburg is responsible for the maintenance for those parking lots and uh, we heard I think when you presented to the Planning Commission as part of the comp plan work session uh, one resident said that his wife had actually broken her ankle in the parking lot behind uh, Barnes and Noble I haven't really seen any progress on maintenance by CW and what's what's the, the, the uh, plan there I expect by the end of next month we'll have something concrete that we can share with council and Staff. Um, our new CEO is um, determined that we're going to make improvements to those. Um, I expect that we will. Uh, thank you. So, thank you. Um, you know, um, so, something Mr. Thang mentioned uh, as a result of his meeting this morning with the city manager. You know, these are projects that we would take on ourselves. Um, Duke of Gloucester Street, um, I think, obviously, is a public street. Um, and the community is pretty pretty adamant that it remain that way and and in that there are public services that need to be uh, extended to the residents that use that street and so um, again I applaud, applaud your effort in redirecting 
the request into tangible projects that um, benefit the community, uh, but then also the visitors that come and, and stay in the hotels and eat in restaurants. Um, it's just going to make the whole area that much better. So thank you. That's a quick question for Tab. What did you mean by reimbursement for all of the projects or for like uh, the funding that would go to like fireworks and grand illumination? What, can you kind of clarify a little bit more on that? Well, so this is really a grant process. So we're giving right. them the 1.3 million and they'll be uh, spending it on these projects and they'll come back to us and give them an accounting next year. So an alternate would have been is we pay the, we reimburse them after each uh, expense is, is presented to us. We're not doing that this year. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Yep. Turn it back over to the mayor. Oh, well, thank you. Wake up. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very much awake. Uh, that concludes our background presentations and discussion for today. That uh, leaves us with City Council communications. Does anybody have anything they would like to report from any of their liaison assignments? Uh, we, the Business Council at the Greater Williamsburg Chamber and Tourism Alliance, uh, had a board retreat over at Centera Hospital. Um, obviously, everyone's okay, but it was a really uh, fruitful conversation uh, talking about board engagement. Thank you. I think uh, city staff will be putting our joint meeting on the calendar for Friday. It's, it's not on yet. The James City County Board right. of Supervisors and the school board. Right. Mr. Trivet, anything you'd like to highlight on schedule of meetings? Oh, um, let's see. So we, obviously we have city council on Thursday. The business roundtable is on March the 10th. Um, the EDA meeting is on the 11th and uh, planning commission on the 18th. It takes us to open forum. Anybody who would like to address council on any matters, welcome to come forward. State your name and address. Keep your remarks to five minutes or less. <laughs> no takers? We have a motion? I move to adjourn. Second. Ms. Felico? Mr. Maslin? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Freiling? Aye. Vice Mayor Pons? Aye. Mr. Zhang? Aye. We're adjourned. <laughs>